The Magic Thief, Chapter 35. When we stepped out of Pedabox's house, it was night again. I'd spent the whole day in the basement room. We need to warn the Duchess and ask her to send guards to Dusk House, I said. Nevery paused at the bottom of the steps. Bennett can go. Keiston would be better, I said. He was all right, and we needed Bennett with us. Nevery raised his eyebrows. Would he? He looked over at Keiston. Well, Keiston, can you be trusted? Keiston, still gripping the lantern, gulped, then nodded. Yes, sir, I swear it. You can trust me, I promise. And yes, all right, Nevery interrupted. Run to the Dawn Palace and tell the Duchess what is happening. Tell her we've gone ahead to the twilight and that she must send as many guardsmen as she can. Understand? Yes, sir, Keiston said. He spun and raced off, slipping a bit on the snow. Let's go, I said. And Nevery, Bennett, and I headed toward the night bridge to cross into the twilight. The streets were deserted and dark. The whirlights had gone out. The night fell desolate, empty. I put my hand in my pocket to check on my locus magicalicus, and it felt empty too, and dead. The magic was gone. We rushed down the hill like three black shadows, our feet crunching on the icy street until we reached the night bridge. Ahead, the road led into the narrow way between the buildings on the bridge. Hold up! Bennett said suddenly, and grabbed Nevery and me by the arms to stop us. We stood, our breath steaming on the frigid air. Ahead, the bridge was completely dark, like a cave. What's the matter? Nevery asked. Bennett shook his head. Too quiet. Underlord might have posted guards. Bennett, we can't wait, I whispered. Bennett pulled a truncheon out of his belt. Follow. He led the way onto the dark bridge. Our footsteps sounded very loud in the silence. Then, from out of the shadows, five dark shapes emerged. Minions. They didn't stop to warn us off, they just leapt at us, wielding clubs. Bennett stepped up to meet them, truncheon swinging. Go! He shouted over his shoulder. He ducked a punch. Nevery and I backed up, our way across the bridge blocked. Three of the minions followed until Bennett threw his truncheon. It whirled through the air and clipped a minion on the back of the head. He fell over like a chopped tree. Bennett leapt on the others. I'll deal with these, he shouted. Just go! We turned and hurried away. I turned and looked over my shoulder and saw one of the minions wrench himself from Bennett's grasp and start after us. We went faster. We didn't speak. The minion following us didn't shout. I heard my own panting breaths and Nevery's and the tap of Nevery's cane and the crunch, crunch, crunch of our feet and the pursuing feet on the icy road. We put on a burst of speed and rounded a corner, Nevery's cloak flaring as he spun around. He pulled out his locus magicalicus, Remurimur, he said, and started muttering a spell. Not enough magic. The minion was getting closer. I pulled on his sleeve. Come on! Nevery cursed and we started off again. This way, I said, and pointed down a street that led toward the river. In the sunrise, the riverbanks were walls built of stone, with stone stairways leading down to wooden docks. We paused on the riverbank and catching our breaths. The air was absolutely still and brittle cold. If somebody hit it, it would shatter into a thousand sharp-edged pieces. There was no sound of rushing water. I pointed at the river. It's frozen. I think we can cross on the ice. Yes, Nevery said, straightening. And then the minion was on us. He was big and brawny. He shoved me out of the way and swung a fist at Nevery. Nevery grappled with him and they went rolling down the nearest set of stone stairs, down to a dock. I raced down after them, leapt from the bottom step onto the minion's back and bit him on the ear. It tasted worse than the rat's tail. The minion shook me off. Then Nevery swung the gold knob of his cane into the minion's face. Ha! He shouted. The minion staggered back, blood streaming from his nose. I scrambled to my feet. You all right? I asked. Yes, boy. Nevery gasped. Behind us, the minion put his hands to his face and shook his head. Drops of blood spattered around him. I turned to survey the river. It was laid out before us, still, frozen the ice clean and smoothly black. To the left loomed the night bridge. No lights shone from the opposite shore. Carefully, I stepped out onto the ice. Without speaking, Nevery followed. We set off, sliding our feet along, skiff, skiff, Nevery using his cane to balance himself. The river bank receded behind us. Overhead, the sky was black and stars shone down as bright as daggers. Halfway across, we paused. My breath puffed out in white clouds before my face. I looked back across the ice. The minion was coming.
Keep going, Nevery said. Under my feet, the ice trembled. Wait, I whispered. I bent down and put my hand flat on the surface. The cold burned, and I felt the river rushing by just below my fingers. Slowly, I stood up. The ice creaked. It was thin, barely covering the water. We'll have to go around, I whispered. Nevery nodded, and we edged around the thin ice and then headed for the dark twilight bank ahead. I looked back over my shoulder. The minion, a dark shape against the dark ice, thought he could catch us by going the short way across. He reached the thin ice and went on. He's going to fall in, I said. As I spoke, the ice beneath the minion gave way, and, like a stone dropping into a puddle, he plunged into the river, cursing and thrashing. I glanced at Nevery. Keep going, he said grimly. We kept going, expecting the ice to crack under our feet and send us into the freezing water too. As we neared the twilight bank, I saw that the tenements and warehouses were all dark and still. At the very edge of the river, we climbed the rocky bank and up onto a rutted path that led along the side of a warehouse. We paused for a moment, catching our breaths, then I started off again. Wait, boy, Nevery said. We can't wait, Nevery, I said. It might be too late already. I started walking, fast, and Nevery strode along beside me. We came around the corner of the warehouse and headed up the nearest steep street, which was edged with tumble-down tenement houses. Too late for what exactly? Nevery asked. I shook my head. I hadn't really had time to think it all through. The Underlord built the device to capture all the magic. If that is what the device is for, Nevery said, it would appear that he plans to hold the city hostage. Right. Magic wasn't just for running the factories or keeping the war lights lit. It was the lifeblood of the city. With the device, Crow's calculations told him, he would control all the magic, and the people would have to pay him for it. He would rule the city, all of it, not just the twilight. But the Underlord was wrong. Nevery, the magic can't stay inside that prison device. It will die, and soon, if we didn't let it out. Boy, the magic isn't alive. I wasn't going to argue with him about it, but if we didn't hurry, it would be too late. We climbed the streets until we reached Dusk House. We peered in through the barred gate. The building was still, dark, and silent, but the air felt wound tight, waiting. We ought to wait for the Duchess's guards, Nevery said softly. I shook my head. The guards would have to fight through the minions on the night bridge, and that might take too long. I don't suppose you have a plan, Nevery said. Nope, I didn't. I think we just have to go in, Nevery, I said. This is why you get into trouble, boy, Nevery muttered. Come on, I said. Staying in the shadows, I led Nevery through the gate and around to the back of the Underlord's mansion, to the door I'd gone in when disguised as a cat. It was unguarded. We made our way through the dark hallways, stopping now and then to listen, hearing nothing. The minions were all off blocking the bridge, I realized. They hadn't expected anyone to cross the ice. Sure as sure, though, they hadn't left the device completely unguarded. Finally, we came to the room with the entrance to the underground workshop. The bookcase door was closed, the room dark. The bookcase opens, I whispered to Nevery, light him across the room, then reached up to push the panel that opened it. The bookcase swung open and the stairway gaped like a pit before us. Without hesitating, I led Nevery down the narrow stairway to the second turning and peered around. The lights in the cavernous workroom were dimmed. In the center of the shadowy room squatted the prisoning device, swollen and shiny like a giant leech well fed on blood. Its gears and pistons were still, and the slow silver was frozen in its crystal tubes. The riveted storage tank in the middle bulged. The magic was caught in there. Down in my bones, I felt a squealing hum, the magic straining at the prison trying to escape. I also felt a faint tingle in the air. A very little bit of the magic was left, lingering outside the device where the rest of it was trapped. Down in the pit, a few minions were lounging around in the shadows, and by one of the chart-covered tables, Pedabox sat writing something by the light of his locust stone. I put my hand in my pocket to check on my own locust stone. A stone could be destroyed by magic, Nevery had told me once, and it's wizard with it. I took a deep breath. The magic had chosen me for this, I reminded myself. I couldn't go off and let it die. I marked out a path from the stairs to the device. I had to try, at least. I eased around the corner. What are you doing, boy? I heard Nevery whisper, but I kept going, creeping down the stairs. 
One of the minions shouted, his voice echoing in the huge workroom. At the sound, Pedabox glanced up from the table. Seeing me, he stood bolt upright, his chair crashing to the floor behind him. You, he shouted. I got to the bottom of the stairs and started to run. The minions closed in. I kept going across the stone floor toward the device. I wasn't sure what I was going to do when I got there, if I got there. A minion made a grab at me. Another one caught at my sleeve, but I eeled away. Pedavox strode across the room, shouting, his words lost in the echoes. I whirled away from another minion, and Pedavox was there, seizing me by the hair, lifting me off my feet. Two minions grabbed me. I twisted and wriggled like a worm on a fish hook, but they had me. Pedavox let me go, drew his hand back, and struck me a crashing blow across the face. If the minions hadn't been holding me, I would have fallen. You, he snarled again. I shook my head. One of my teeth was loose and I had blood in my mouth. Black spots danced before my eyes. From where I stood, the minions gripping my eyes, t my arms tightly, I saw the device looming overhead, the dim light glinting off its gears and wires. Pedavox leaned over me, teeth bared. You're dead, thief. The Underlord will return shortly and he will kill you himself. He drew back his fist to hit me again. I closed my eyes and clenched my teeth. But then came a shout. Pedavox! Nevery bellowed. My eyes popped open. Down the stairs, Nevery strode, his gray cloak swirling. At the bottom, he swung his knob-headed cane and slammed it into a table, cluttered with leftover copper parts. They clattered to the ground. Pedavox jerked up and around. The minions holding me stared, but their grips didn't loosen. Striding across the floor, drawing on the magic left outside the device, Nevery began a spell. A river of words that flowed from his mouth and swelled to fill the room, echoing from the walls. Just beneath the ceiling, way overhead, wisps of fog appeared, then gathered into clouds, gray and plump with rain. The giant workroom grew dark. Nevery shouted the last word of the spell, and the clouds rumble rolled together. Lightning flashed down. With a shriek, Pedavox leapt out of the way, and the bolt scorched the ground where he'd stood. The minions held, holding me staggered. Thunder growled. Nevery started another spell. Pedavox was shouting a spell of his own. Their voices echoed from the walls. Overhead, the clouds' bellies swelled, then exploded. Bolts of lightning zinged in all directions, ricocheting from one stone wall to the other, and then crashing into the device. Sparks leapt from its rivets and gears, but the magic stayed locked within. A sizzling blue bolt whizzed just over my head. The two minions holding me flinched. That was all I needed. With a twist of my shoulders, I pulled myself out of the minion's hands, kicking one of them in the shins and sprinting toward the device. The minions shouted and followed, right on my heels. Reaching the device, I scrambled up the stone base it rested on, then climbed onto a piston. The metal sparked under my fingers. One of the minions coming after me jumped for my foot, but I reached up to a gear and pulled myself out of his reach. I climbed higher, over tubes, clinging to hoses, until I reached the bulging storage tank. Out in the workroom, Nevery and Pedabox were shouting at each other, their voices echoing off the stone walls. Thunder crashed again and the clouds opened, releasing a torrent of freezing rain. Blinking water from my eyes, I climbed higher. The rain hit the device and turned to ice. I hung on with numb fingers. A minion climbed up from below me. Another one shouted and threw a bottle. It shattered just over my head and I shut my eyes as shards of glass rained down. Opening my eyes, I pulled my Locus Magicalicus from my coat pocket. The jewel glowed in the stormy light. I didn't know any spells for this. I rested my forehead against the freezing copper skin of the storage tank and gently tapped my Locus Stone against the tank. It made a tinny chiming sound. Come out, I told the magic. Just come through the stone. Inside its prison, the magic strained. I felt it, confined, desperate, dying. Another bottle shattered beside my head. The minion climbing up from below grabbed my ankle and pulled. I slipped and almost dropped my locust stone, then gripped an icy cogwheel from my other hand and held on. The minion pulled harder. I kicked him, and then I kicked him again. Screaming, the minion fell away, bouncing off the side of the device before crashing to the floor. I pulled myself back up to the storage tank. With shaking hands, I moved my locust magicalicus over the surface of the tank and held it against one of the riveted seams. Come out, I whispered. Here is a good place. Again, I tapped my locust stone against the seam. The magic strained against the tank. The riveted seam creaked and bulged, but held. Here, magic, I whispered again. Within the tank, the magic stilled. 
shifted and focused itself on my locus of magicalicus, on me. It was like looking up at a night sky full of stars and having the stars suddenly look back. I closed my eyes, calm breath, still hands. I thought my way through my locus stone and into the device and opened the lock. Here, come out. The room held its breath. I heard no shouting, no thunder or wind, or sizzling bolts of lightning, just a black and velvety silence that filled my head and stilled my breath. The riveted seam along the side of the tank bulged, then, like cloth ripping, split. With the crash of thunder and lightning striking at the same time, the magic burst from the device and threw my locust stone, roaring through me. It filled my sight, a wave of crashing, flashing light, sparks, blazing white flames, a thousand stars. I clung to my locus magicalicus, and the magic kept coming, pouring out until it filled the workroom, then exploding upward, blowing the top off the device, smashing through dusk house, fountaining out into the dark night. In my hand, my locus magicalicus disintegrated into a puff of sparkling dust. I was flung away like a leaf in the wind. I expected to be dead. But instead, everything went still. Inside my head, the magic said something, its words a deep rumbling hum inside my skull and down in the heavier bones of my arms and legs. I floated, wrapped in a warm and welcoming blanket of light, and then everything went dark. Snevery's Journal Device destroyed now, and we can hope to never see its like again in this world. Destroyed at cost of Boy's locus magicalicus, possibly his life. After Boy released the confined magic and Dusk House was raised, found myself at the bottom of gaping pit in darkness, a few small fires burning, debris everywhere, dust sifting down, rubble settling, not a trace of the device, it had been utterly destroyed. Managed to kindle a bit of light with Lothfulus' spell and searched ruins for the boy. Found him wedged in a narrow crack that had opened in one stone wall, as if he'd been set there for safekeeping. Way in, blocked by debris. Thought boy was dead. Pale, cold, unmoving. Covered with fine, scintillant dust. The remains of his locus magicalicus. A loss too great to bear. Duchess's guards arrived then, and Bennett, who helped me pull the beams and rubble away from Boy's body, had him out finally, placed my hand on his chest, found he was still breathing, wrapped him in my robe and Bennett's coat, took him home to heart's ease, put him to bed, had Trammell in to look at him. Not a mark on the boy, Trammell said. No apparent injury. He is simply cold and exhausted, needs to sleep, keep him warm and wait for him to wake up. So now... We wait.